Hi, my name is Jeremy Lickness, and I just got started with astrophotography this year in January of 2021. Like many people, I was overwhelmed with the different phrases and terminology and processes, so I made this video series to help anyone who's just getting started get familiar with the different aspects of image processing. So let's check it out. There are three phases to typical image processing workflow, stacking, linear processing, and nonlinear processing. I'll explain all of these, but in this video, we're going to focus on stacking. Let's start with why stacking is even important. This is a picture of the North American Nebula, NGC 7000. It's a very impressive nebula, but if you looked at this picture, you probably wouldn't be very impressed. This is a 10 second exposure, and it just simply doesn't gather enough light to get the detail of the nebula. Let's see what happens if we take multiple exposures and combine them to see the cumulative effect. As you can see, stacking makes a huge difference from this before picture to this after picture. Some reasons why we stack include combining multiple images to increase the exposure time. If you're using filters, for example, narrowband or red, green, and blue filters, stacking helps combine the filters. And stacking multiple images helps raise the signal and eliminate the noise. The noise is averaged out based on more frames that you stack. Stacking is short for pre-processing workflow that can involve multiple steps. These include image calibration, cosmetic correction, debayer demosaic, star alignment, and the actual image integration. I'm going to cover each of these in the following few minutes. The first step is usually image calibration. This involves taking your regular images, these are your actual photographs that you've taken, and then adding what's called calibration frames. For example, a dark has the exact same settings as the light as far as exposure and ISO, but the lens is blocked from any light so that it captures any of the noise from the sensor. This can be subtracted from the lights. We'll see what that looks like. Flats are another way to also capture a uniform white image, and any deviation from that represents things like dust, aberrations in the lens, vignetting caused by the curvature of the lens. That can also be corrected. You have dark flats, which are darks taken under flat conditions. And then you have a bias. A bias is like a dark, but you do the fastest exposure time, the highest shutter speed. Basically, the aperture is open for the least amount possible to get a baseline reading of noise. How do you perform these operations? There's a lot of software. This is not a comprehensive list. But these are some of the tools that can be used in the stacking workflow. Let's take a look at image calibration in a little more depth. How about a visual look at what exactly happens with image calibration? First, let's look at the overview. We've got our darks, lights, flats, and bias. And you won't always have all of these. In fact, most of the time, I may process an image with just lights and darks. The darks are processed together to create a master dark, which is representative of all the noise. The bias, bias frames are also combined to create a master bias. These can then be combined with the flats to create calibrated flats that then result in a master flat and finally, all of this is used to create calibrated lights. This is an example of a light. This is a picture that has several stars in it. And you'll notice there's a lot of really tiny stars. A lot of those aren't actually stars, 
but are defects in the sensor. You can see the bigger round bright objects are the stars, the smaller points are noise. If we now completely cover the lens and take a picture, it looks like this. This is my dark. My dark should be completely dark, but it's not because the pixels have defects. So we've got the light and we've got the dark. So now what we can do is take that light and subtract the noise that we captured in the dark. And it looks like this. So this light minus this dark equals this. And you can see it's cleaned up our image quite a bit. Cosmetic correction helps the image even more. The previous image still had some noise left on it. So what cosmetic correction does is it helps remove hot pixels, which are pixels that are brighter or register even when there's no light, and cold pixels, which are sensors that don't register or are darker than other sensors. Here's our calibrated picture. We've gone through image calibration. Now we take it through cosmetic correction. Notice the difference? It's removed these hot pixels and probably some cold pixels that we can't see. Just to make an argument of why image calibration and cosmetic correction are so important, let's go back to the original image. This is what the original looked like. This is the corrected image. It makes a world of difference to apply these techniques. If you're using a CCD or CMOS camera, chances are you're using a bare filter. The camera's sensors can only sense the intensity of the light. They can't sense the wavelength or the color. So the solution for this is to put a matrix over top of filters that are usually red, green, and blue. And knowing where the filters are means that intensity of light measured was just measured for the red, the green, or the blue. So the concept is like this. This is an image I've taken of the Orion Nebula that is in the bare mode. It's the raw mode. It's just a set of intensities. Now we can look at a 4x4 grid and see that there's different intensity levels. Those would average together to create one pixel of intensity. And this is how it's rendered so that we can visualize that image. Now if we know what array of filter was used, we can map the intensity levels to the color. And here you can see that we're actually detecting green twice in that square. And we've got one that's slightly darker and one that's slightly lighter. But the important thing is these pigments combine to form a true color. So we go in, in this case, this would be an RGGB array. We go from this to this. The process of mapping the correct filter array and translating those intensities to colors is called debayering or demosaicing. The next step in the process is star alignment, or getting the frames to align correctly so that they can be stacked. The concept's like this. Let's say you've taken two pictures of the same star, but the stars shifted in the frame. The star is represented by the blue pixels, and you can see it's down in the center bottom on one picture, and it's in the center right on the other. If we were to combine these frames, we would get something that looked like this, which would be a stretched out star and is not the desired result. What would be better is if we could detect stars based on patterns relative to other stars, and use those as the points to overlay the images so that we do something like this and get the star in the correct place. Let's take a look at this in a practical example. It's several pictures I've taken of the Orion Nebula. My camera was in a tripod and so as I was snapping pictures the nebula was moving. You can see the background and the light pollution on the right hand side are pretty constant, as are the defective pixels, but the stars move across the background. Now let's apply star alignment and see what that looks like. For star alignment, I picked a reference frame, and now all of the other frames have been shifted to that reference frame. So you can see 
that there's a black border that's moving where the image was shifted out of what I was able to capture. But now what is interesting to me in the photograph, which is the stars and the nebula, are in a fixed location ready to stack. We finally made it to image integration. We've prepped our images, we've aligned them, we're ready to stack them. Let's see what that looks like. I'm going to go into PixInsight and I'm going to simply add the files that have been registered or star aligned. So I'm going to pick these. Notice I'm in the image integration dialog. I can set the way I want to combine them. In fact, there's a few different ways. There's different normalization techniques. This will basically average out the intensity levels and background to clean it up a little bit. We've got some information about whether or not we truncate pixels that are out of range. And then we also have what's called pixel rejection algorithms, which determine what pixels to throw out because they're basically noise and not signal. Now, looking at this, it looks like we've got a few different options. I'm going to go with this generalized extreme student dies deviate uh, just to try it out. And then we've got a few other options, but I'm going to leave it right here and go ahead and click the apply button. And what we're going to see is it's going through loading these images, averaging the pixels together, rejecting based on the algorithm, and it should spin through fairly quickly on this machine. So we've let it run for several minutes. We're at about 90% on channel three. So we're gonna let that finish out. And then we should get to our stacked result from the example I was showing of the Orion Nebula. And of course, 99% always takes the longest. It's going to do a run, evaluate the noise. And we should get an image here. I'm going to go ahead and pick this. And this is what's called a linear image. Notice that I can't see anything because the light levels are so low. Let's go ahead and artificially stretch it so that we can see what's going on and we're going to have to link our channels here. So what we'll do is we'll open screen transfer function, and then we'll take this link button, reapply, and that's our combined image. So as you can see, it's pretty sharp, but there's still some light pollution and some other work this is where we go into the next phase, which is nonlinear processing. We are done with stacking. I'm sorry, the next phase is linear processing.